Dan, thank you for that lovely introduction. And thank you for having me here. I must say, I'm somewhat daunted by being the second Francis Bacon lecturer because the previous lecturer was Elliot Sober, someone whom I admire enormously. And he's a genuine intellectual giant. So basically, I don't think I can quite match what uh, his, his uh, status, but it's uh, wonderful to be here. And thank you very much indeed. I am um, also glad to be here because it gives me an opportunity to ride a hobby horse. I've been riding for 30 odd years which is really um, about a preoccupation I have, which at last I brought together in a single book, Aping Mankind, uh, which I can show you the cover of. Yes, indeed. Um, which talks about things that I think are actually wrong about the current way in which we think about our nature. Now, if you feel sometime during this lecture you fall into the hands of someone who has a chronic obsession. You're absolutely right. I used to argue with my tutor in physiology at Oxford about the kinds of things I'm going to talk about to you today. I have to say he was infinitely patient. Of course, in those days, universities were so organized that you could be infinitely patient. They didn't have as sort of narrowly defined targets and so on and so forth. So he could listen to me whinging on about the inability of neuroscience to explain memory and so on and so forth. But my, my master theme is biologism, the assumption that we humans are essentially animal organisms and are best understood through biological science. And this is an idea of some antiquity. It goes all the way back to Hippocrates, but it currently has unprecedented currency in academe, in the Republic of Letters, and in the popular press. And one of the most disturbing consequences of the ascendance of biologism is the belief, increasingly widespread in academe, that the humanities should acknowledge the cognitive superiority of biological science and capitulate to the imperialist ambitions of neuroscience and evolutionary theory. Traditionally, we've thought of human beings as persons who are conscious agents, responsible to a greater or lesser degree for their actions and somehow offset from the natural world. The alternative view of humans as organisms that are part of the natural world is now gaining strength. We are not as distant from nature as construed by natural science as we imagine we were, so we are told. We do not so much lead our lives as enact our biological inheritance. Any impression we have to the contrary is based on an illusion. Now, there are many factors behind the rise of biologism, but the most important are firstly the astonishing advances in our understanding of the human body, the human organism. Now, this has been incorrectly interpreted as telling us what it is to be a human being. The second is the assumption common in secular societies that if we abandon supernatural accounts of what we are, we're also obliged to, dis to deny our distance from the natural world and to seek a naturalistic, a biological and physical, uh, physical, physical understanding of what we are. And I would submit that both of these assumptions are wrong. We are more than just our bodies as understood biologically. We are embodied subjects who are, possess, utilize, take care of, judge, interpret, and have factual knowledge of our bodies in a multitude of ways. And secondly, there is a middle position that sees us as neither supernatural nor entirely part of nature. We are extranatural. Now, biologism is founded on two pillars of unwisdom, neuromania and Darwinitis, and I want to offer you a brief account of each. Neuromania is based on the assumption that human consciousness is identical with neural activity in the human brain. I am my brain, you are your brain. The brain explains every aspect of human awareness and behavior and so on. And from this it follows that if you want to understand human beings, you must peer into the darkness inside their skulls using neuroscientific techniques for recording brain activity. Now the neuromaniac's favorite tool, favorite toy, is a tool which has made huge contributions to pucker neuroscience, and I've used it myself in my own research into stroke, functional magnetic resonance imaging. An example of which you see here, and I'm going to return to it, though it has become a fast-acting solvent of the critical sense, as Matt Crawford has said. It's almost impossible to open a newspaper without an example of a brain scan next to an article, breathless with excitement, reporting that scientists have found the secret of love, of wisdom, or of our sense of beauty. You just expose subjects to the relevant stimuli and see which bits of the brain light up. Let's now turn our attention to the other pillar, Darwinitis. 
This is an inflamed or pathological version of Darwinism, which asserts that evolutionary theory explains not only how the organism Homo sapiens arose, which it certainly does, but also the nature of people like you and me. Evolutionary forces, natural selection, survival advantage explain the origin and the purpose of human behavior and human institutions. Everything is forged in and distantly or otherwise relates to the bloodbath in which genes are shaped by the differential survival of organisms. Of course, it's rarely expressed as crudely as that, but this is the ultimate implication. The processes that produce millipedes were those that produced Mozart. In brief, it is the assumption that Darwinism encompasses not only the biological roots of the human organism, fine, but the cultural leaves of the human person, not fine. The boldest, most far-reaching, and most crudest manifestation of Darwinitis is evolutionary psychology, to which I'll ultimately return. So much for the two pillars of biologism. They are, of course, closely connected. If the human mind is identical with the functioning of the brain, and the brain, as it surely is, is an evolved organ, then our minds, our consciousness, and our conscious behavior must be understood in evolutionary terms, as ultimately the servant of the reproductive imperative of the selfish gene. Since, as Theodosius Dobchansky said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, the neural explanation of human consciousness demands a Darwinian interpretation of our behavior. The mind is simply the most powerful of the organs in the vehicle that the genes requisition to ensure their own survival. Now, you may think this sounds pretty harmless stuff, or better than harmless, a frank acknowledgement of what we are. But let's look at the consequences of biologism, in particular neuromania, as drawn out by the eminent neuroscientist Colin Blakemore in his Reese lectures many years ago, The Mechanics of Mind. What does he say? The human brain is a machine which alone accounts for all our actions, our most private thoughts, our beliefs. All our actions are products of the activity of our brains. It makes no sense, he says, in scientific terms, to try to distinguish sharply between acts that result from conscious attention and those that result from our reflexes or are caused by disease or damage to the brain. This, of course, has huge implications for our freedom. If we are identical with our brains, or with certain neural discharges in our brains, we must be just as free as when we're writing a textbook about the management of seizures, as I've done, as when we ourselves are in the grip of a seizure. It makes no sense, in neuroscientific terms, to distinguish between these things. And many have drawn this conclusion and asserted that free will is an illusion. Rita Carter, a brilliant popularizer of neuroscience, has even offered an explanation of the illusion of freedom in Darwinian terms. The illusion of free will, she says, is deeply ingrained precisely because it prevents us from falling into a suicidal, fatalistic state of mind. It's one of the, most, one of the brain's most powerful aids to survival. Well, if we're in the grip of biological forces, which boil down to physical forces, we cannot be aware of the true reasons for our actions. Indeed, we're not agents at all. We are absorbed into nature, natural parts of a natural world which given that living matter is ultimately regulated by the laws of matter, physical laws of matter, we are material parts of the material world, wired into the forces that are described by physics. I'm sorry to say that some of this is acknowledged with great good cheer by writers, noted, notably Daniel Dennett, when he speaks of Darwin's dangerous idea as a universal acid that eats through just about every traditional concept and leaves in its wake a revolutionized worldview in which our most cherished beliefs about God, value, meaning, purpose, culture, and morality are shown to be without foundation. Well, I'm happy to deal with, you know, to lose God, but the rest I'm worried about. But of course, this applies only if accepting Darwinism requires one to subscribe to Darwinitis. And I would strongly concess this, as does Alex Rosenberg in his nihilistic Darwinism. He argues that Dunnett correctly saw the corrosive effect of Darwin's theory but then failed to acknowledge that this would lead to metaphysical nihilism. The world, nature, and human life are empty of meaning. And ethical nihilism, morality is not about values, but about the needs of our genes. Ultimately, everything we do is an expression of the blind laws of physics. And this is true if we believe that Darwinism means Darwinitis. And it's this that makes it rather extraordinary that so many in the humanities, 
which one might have expected would be a bulwark against scientism, should have embraced neuroscience and evolutionary theory as a guide to their own disciplines with such enthusiasm. Collaboration rather than resistance seems to be in the watchword in some quarters. They have listened to the words of the once despised prophet, E.O. Wilson, who argued that the humanities, ranging from philosophy and history to moral reasoning, comparative religion, interpretation of the arts, will draw closer to the sciences and partly fuse with them. And just in case you've forgotten where this leads to, Wilson spells it out in his visionary consilience, his dream of unified knowledge. Total consilience, he says, holds that nature is organized by simple universal laws of physics to which all other laws and principles can eventually be reduced. The humanities, social science, English literature and so on, are simply primitive physics. And when they see themselves aright, they will acknowledge this. Of course, they haven't quite got this far, but there are some rather impressive or impressively nauseating halfway houses. For example, there is the flourishing discipline of neuroesthetics, which explains both creativity and aesthetic pleasure in terms of activity in certain parts of the brain. Brain tingles is all. This propensity for brain tingles, we're told, has been implanted in us by evolution, hence Darwinian aesthetics, which makes sure that we tingle to the right kinds of things. For example, pictures of symmetrical faces or of landscapes loaded with food. Neurolaw aims to replace the untidy processes of the judicial system with a biological justice rooted in an understanding of the neural causes of action. Neuroeconomics can explain why we buy things we don't need or we shouldn't buy by looking at the balance between the wanted center in the amygdaloid body and the wait until you can afford it center in the frontal lobe. Those toxic subprime mortgages were in fact neurotoxic. Conspicuous consumption and our trillion pound debts are due to our desire to advertise our genetic health, like the peacock's tail. Neuropoliticians tell us that we should look beyond the ideologies of the right and left to an understanding of the rivalry between the right and left hemisphere. Neurotheologians look for God spots in the brain where religious experiences and beliefs are located. The evolutionary theorists of religion tell us that the God spot has been implanted in our brains because, believe it or not, religion promotes solidarity and inclusive fitness. Inclusive fitness is the sum of an organism's classical fitness, how many of offspring it can produce and support, and the number of equivalents of its own offspring it can add to, it can add to the population by supporting and cooperating with others. So it's all right to lay down your life for another as long as that results in more copies of your genes being carried in another organism. And religious belief supports pro-social behavior that will likewise support the interests of the genes shared by the group. Tell that to the historians of the confessional wars, but that's another story. Now, it wouldn't take very long to expose the fallacies that are, that are the foundation stones of these pseudodisciplines. I haven't got time to in this talk, but the point for the present is that they are symptoms, symptoms of a biologic, biologistic view of mankind. This is what I want to focus on. Now, the fact that such a view has undesirable consequences should not cut any ice. Just because you don't like something, as I don't like this, it doesn't make it untrue. There's only an accidental connection between the, unpal un between the palatable and the true. I actually find it rather unpalatable to think I'm going to die one day, but this doesn't mean to say that I'm immortal. Yuck is not an argument. So I now need to focus on the fundamental errors of neuromania and Darwinitis. And let me start with neuromania. I want to look briefly at the logical errors behind neuromania, then talk about the current limitations of the neuroscience that make many claims premature. And finally, about the fundamental, insuperable barriers to neural explanations of consciousness that would remain even if the current limitations of neuroscience were overcome. But first, the central muddle. As a clinical neuroscientist for many years, I'm fully aware that to live a human life requires a brain in some kind of working order. What I dispute is that it follows from this that living a human life is to be a brain in some kind of working order. Neuroscience reveals some of the most important necessary conditions of behavior and awareness. What it does not do is to provide a satisfactory account of the sufficient conditions of human awareness and human behavior. And the mistaken idea it does is at the essence of neuromania. The philosophical error is to assume that the very rough correlations between neural activity, you can see in the brain, and certain levels of wakefulness, certain kinds of experience, 
a propensity to behave in a certain way, means that this neural activity is wakefulness, is identical with experience, is the whole story of a propensity to behave in a certain way. Let me now move to the empirical problems and illustrate them with two much discussed studies which seem to some to confirm that even our most complex feelings and emotions and activities are reducible to brain activity. And that even when we feel we're acting voluntary, it's not we but our brains that are calling the shots. Or perhaps we are our brains in, who, in which the shots are being called. I want to talk first of all about Semiazeki and Andrea Bartel's study of the neurobiology of love and then secondly, Benjamin Libet's studies of voluntary motor activity. And I apologize to those who heard me talk this morning because they will have, have a sense of déjà écouté. But first, is the sound? Yes, of course. Anybody any good at the sound? Um, uh, of course, yeah. You could say there was a button. Yes. But where is it? Is there a doctor in the house? Yes. An acoustic doctor? Give a wave. I think he's recording it, so... Ah. Um, you can read, yes. I think if you speak up for the moment and then we'll... Yes, of course. Do you know, my kids say I've got a penetrating voice, particularly in restaurants, but obviously even without a, a, a lemon. Shall I move this forward? What about this? How's that? Can you hear me, Mother? Is that a bit better? No, it's my loud tie that's interfering, is it? I don't know. It's sort of, uh, yeah. um, shall I keep going? Because I'm not too sure we have... How, how is it at the back? Fine, yeah. Oh, here we are. Oh, thank you. I've got a problem with, with my... I, I'm, I'm, quiet. Let's yeah. can put this in there. I've been well. accused of too much diffidence, which is the first time it's happened in my life. But, um, yeah. Thank you much. So we'll see if I can improve that. Yeah. Okay. How, can you hear me, Mother? Is that okay? Great, great, great. Ah, uh, gosh. So, let me now move to the empirical problems and illustrate them with two much discussed studies which seem to some to confirm that even our most complex feelings, emotions and activities are reducible to brain events and that even when we feel we're acting voluntarily, we are our brains, our brains rather, are calling the shots. I'm, talk I'm going to refer to Semiozeki and Andrea Bartel's study of the neurobiology of love and secondly, Benjamin Libet's studies of voluntary motor activity. First, let me talk about, oops, a daisy. Not oops, a daisy, but this. First, Semiozeki and Andrea Bartels claim that they've discovered the center for romantic love, love brackets romantic, because they've also done studies on love brackets uncontingent and love brackets maternal. But this is a paper they've focused on romantic love. How did they discover the nature of romantic love? Well, they asked their subjects, to place their heads in an MRI scan while they were looking at a photograph of the face of someone with whom they were deeply in love, and then at those of three friends. By subtracting the activity of the brain recorded when they looked at their friends from that which was seen when they looked at their lovers, they claimed to be able to demonstrate the distinctive brain activity associated with love, brackets romantic, and brackets. And here it is. Love romantic is due to activity in the medial insula and the anterior cingulate cortex, and subcortically in the caudate nucleus and the putamen, or you'd be glad to know bilaterally. <laughs> Me neither. But here it is in pictures. This awakens wonder not that love could be tucked away in such a small space, but how could anyone feel to see the, fail to see the fallacies in the experimental design? These are many and various, and I would be happy to discuss them in Q&A, but the ones I want to focus on are those that relate to the grotesque reduction of the state of love. Love, as we all know in this room, I suspect, is not like a response to a simple stimulus such as a picture. It's not even a single enduring state, like being cold. It is a many splendid and many misery thing. It includes, as anyone who's been in love, or read about it in a book, or even read about it in a cranium book, will know that it includes many things. Not feeling in love at that moment, hunger for, simulating difference to, Delight over the beloved, wanting to be kind to, wanting to be impre to its impress the special other, worrying over the logistics of meetings, lust, a bit of biology there, or surprise, joy, guilt, anger, jealousy, imagining conversations, events, speculating what the loved one is doing, and feeling, and so on. To construe it as the property of a giblet, even a special giblet inside the cranium, or indeed part of that giblet, 
or even as an organism, of, of an organism, is to overlook the extent, notwithstanding all its physiological components and the biological roots of some aspects of it, the extent to which it belongs to a self relating to a community of minds, of which more presently. Now, the neuralization of love requires its prior reduction to the response to something like a simple, repeatable stimulus. And this is deeply connected with the project of stuffing something whose theater is the community of selves operating in the human world out there back into the intracranial darkness, back into the standalone brain. Even the neuroscience community, you'll be glad to know, is starting to feel uneasy about simplistic identification of activity in parts of the brain with human feelings and propensities to behavior. In a paper originally provocatively entitled Voodoo Correlations in Social Neuroscience, Ed Vols and Harold Paschler found flaws with the localizations observed in such studies. I'd be happy to talk about that. The process of simplification to prepare a piece of our humanity to be stuffed back into a bit of the brain is evident in my second example. A famous set of experiments carried out by the neurophysiologist Benjamin Libet in the 1980s and repeated and refined many times since. Described by the neurophysiologist Patrick Haggard as one of the philosophically most challenging studies in modern scientific psychology. It seems to show that our brain makes decisions to act before our conscious mind is aware of them. So they're not really our decisions at all. In a typical experiment, Libet's subjects are instructed to make a simple movement, to bend their right wrist or the fingers of their right hand in their own time. Using brainwave recording, the experimenter records a particular activity in the brain that indicates a readiness to move. This is the so-called readiness potential that's seen in, part, in the part of the cerebral cortex most closely associated with voluntary movement. Libet also asked his subjects to recall the position of a spot revolving around a clock face in order to determine the time when they were first aware of their urge or intention to make a movement. To his surprise, he found that the readiness potential occurred consistently a third of a second before the time at which the subjects reported being aware of a decision to move. And Libet concluded from this that the brain, not the subject, not the person, decided to initiate or at least to prepare to initiate the act before there was any reportable subjective awareness of a decision having been made. Put more simply, the cerebral accompaniments of our action seem to occur before our conscious awareness of deciding to perform them. And this experiment is still discussed widely. And it was on the Today program, some of you may be aware of, uh, last Saturday, Anthony Gottlieb, who had stolen most of his ideas, from, from, no, he, who got most of his ideas from my book, um, uh, debated with Patrick Haddigan. Um, more recently, delete that from the recording, um, Dylan Hayes and colleagues carried out studies in which a succession of letters were displayed on a screen. Subjects were asked to press a left or a right button at a moment of their own choosing and to note the letter which was being displayed at the same time that they felt they were making a decision to press the button. The letter was a time marker. Two regions that lit up in the brain predicted the choice of the subject, whether the subject is going to press the right button or the left button. Remarkably, the regions in question lit up a full five seconds before the individual was aware of having made a choice. So the scientists knew five seconds before the individual made a choice which way they were going to go. The authors concluded that there is a network of high-level control areas that begins to prepare an upcoming decision long before it enters awareness. It doesn't look like we know what we're doing until we've found we've done it. That's the conclusion. And from this and from many other experiments, Daniel Wegner has concluded that the only connection between willing something and acting is that both come from the same unconscious source. Hold on a moment. The action that the subjects were asked to perform was incredibly simple, a flexion of a wrist, a mere movement. That movement, however, was itself only a minute part of a long sequence of movements amounting to a large-scale action which could be described as taking part in Dr. Libet's experiment. This large-scale action began at least as far back as getting up in the morning to visit Dr. Libet's laboratory after perhaps setting the alarm to make sure one wasn't late. It involved consenting to take part in an experiment whose nature and purpose and safety was fully understood and required, amongst many other things, listening to and understanding and agreeing to the instructions that were received and then deciding to flex the wrist. Now, once this is appreciated, then the temporal relation between the last step, the wrist flexing, and the potential in the brain 
seen in the lab becomes unimportant. The decision to participate in the experiment, which alone gave the wrist flexion its meaning, began not milliseconds, not seconds or minutes, but hours, perhaps longer before the wrist was flexed. This flexing of the wrist is just the last component of an action called taking part in Dr. Libet's experiment, which would itself be part of a greater intentional whole, such as wanting to please Dr. Libet, or indeed wanting to help those clever scientists to understand the brain, as it might one day help doctors to treat my child's brain injury or whatever. Libet's experiment illustrates how the neuromaniac case against freedom, seemingly demonstrating that we are our brains and our brains are calling the shots, is rooted in a very distorted conception of what constitutes an action in everyday life. If you want to make voluntary actions seem involuntary, the first thing to do is to strip away their context and then effectively break them down into their physical elements. This gets you well on the way to eliminating the difference between a twitch and a deliberate action and to make an action seem as if it could be explained by a burst of neural impulses embedded in a no-person neural reality, which is the brain, rather than in a first-person world where behavior is not atomic but interconnected. Well, so much for the empirical evidence that seems to support the assumption that consciousness boils down to neural activity. But let me subject this assumption now to direct criticism. My critique is based upon this inescapable fact. When we're talking about the brain, we're talking about a piece of matter subject to the laws of physics. This is what Daniel Dunnett, a leading neuromaniac, pointed out. He says there's only one sort of stuff, namely matter. The physical stuff of physics, chemistry, and physiology. And the mind is somehow nothing but a physical phenomenon. In short, the mind is the brain. We can, in principle, account for every mental phenomenon using the same physical principles, laws, and raw materials that suffice to explain radioactivity, continental drift, photosynthesis, reproduction, nutrition, and growth. Now, if we keep this in mind, we have enough ammunition to demonstrate the necessary failure of neuroscientific accounts of human consciousness and conscious behavior. And I emphasize human consciousness because it has unique features that are particularly intractable to assimilation in matter. Intentionality, first person being, unity in within and over time, and temporal depth. And I'll deal with those in due course. My central message is this. If we have serious problems understanding the relationship between the brain and even ground floor consciousness, such as perception, it's absurd to look to brain science to cast light on the upper stories of human consciousness. That's why I'm going to focus on this very basic level. And that's why I'm, it's necessary to take you through some philosophical arguments, which the gentleman in the middle row may complain about, which may, uh, may seem hard going. You have to blame your boredom in the next five to ten minutes on the neuromaniacs. It's not my fault. So let's begin on the ground floor with perception as it is experienced in humans. The explicit sense of being aware of something other than oneself. Consider my awareness, or this lady's awareness, of the glass in front of her. The standard account says that her perception of the glass is the result of the light reflected from the glass entering her eyes and triggering activity in her visual pathways. There's an unbroken causal chain connecting the glass with neural activity in her brain. This chain of causes and effects is entirely compatible with physics, with physical science. Unfortunately for neuromania, the inward causal path does not deliver her awareness of the glass. Her awareness of the glass as an item separate, explicitly separate from there, as over there with respect to herself, who's over here. There's nothing in the activity in the visual cortex, the back of my brain, which would make that activity be about the thing that she sees, about something other than herself. The inward causal chain, that was the upper arrow, explains how the light gets into her brain, but not how this results in a gaze that looks out. In other words, we have something fundamental that is left unexplained. Many of you who are philosophers in the audience will be familiar that this is called intentionality, which makes the activity in the visual cortex, if it is absolutely crucial, be about the glass. Intentionality is utterly mysterious, not least, as you can see from the slide, that it points in the opposite direction to causality, in the opposite direction to the causal chain that passes into the visual cortex through it to other parts of the cortex, and eventually to those parts of the brain that are associated with movement, motor activity. Intentionality is not feedback or reverse causation. Rather, it is something that I've argued in Aping Mankind that opens up an otherwise apparently causally closed world and makes it something that an agent can operate on. 
If neuromania were true, my perception of the glass would require the activity in my visual cortex to reach causally upstream to the events that cause them. And this is inexplicable in material terms. And crucially for my argument, it is most explicitly developed in human perception. And this is where we have to begin when we're trying to understand human consciousness, in particular, high-level consciousness such as love, our sense of beauty, wisdom, and so on. The neural theory of consciousness cannot deal with the essentially relational aspect of consciousness for which a single player, the activity in my brain, is not enough. Intentionality, which cannot be ascribed to material events such as nerve impulses, is of utmost significance, as I've teased out at great length in Aping Mankind, and I've argued that it tears open the hitherto seamless fabric of a causally closed material world as described by physics. It's the seed of first-person being, the basis of viewpoint, a viewpoint that's planted in a no-person, viewpointless physical universe. It's the basis of our uniquely human freedom and of the community of minds and the human world, that nexus of meanings and signs, the semiosphere that is beyond the bi biosphere and consequently beyond the reach of neuroscience. Suffice it to say that it creates the possibility of an ever-widening gap which we humans are realizing between the conscious individual and the material world. And this possibility is realized in humans, as I've said, who are not simply organisms, but embodied subjects. We are surrounded not just by matter, but by that -a, most clearly expressed in factual knowledge, held in common and housed in language, such as the body of knowledge that is brain science. Now, focusing on intentionality brings us to the heart of the trouble that the neural theory of perception, and hence neuromania, is in. Its central claim that the material interaction between two material objects, say brain and this glass, will cause one to appear to the other. The countercausal direction of intentionality not only shows that this cannot be accommodated in physical science, but that appearance is not something that the material world, as seen through science, affords. Indeed, we could go further and argue that the progressive enclosure of the world within the framework of physical science, its being construed as a material world, tends towards the elimination or the disappearance of appearance, and hence the disappearance of consciousness. As the science of matter progresses, measurement takes us further from actual experience, further from the phenomena of subject subjective consciousness, to a realm in which things are described in abstract general quantitative terms. The most obvious symptom of this is the way physical science has to discard secondary qualities. It's a philosophical term for items such as color experiences, feelings of warmth, cold, and taste, the things that are filling your consciousness at the moment. They're regarded as somehow unreal, or at least as falling short of what the furniture of the material world is in itself. For the physicist, light is not in itself bright or colorful, it's a mixture of vibrations in an electromagnetic field of different frequencies. The material world, far from being the colorful, noisy, smelly place we experience, is composed, according to physical science, of colorless, silence, odorless atoms, or quarks, or whatever, whose nature and behavior is best described mathematically. So nothing in physical science, or nothing in the brain understood as a piece of matter, can explain why the brain should find, uncover, or create appearances, and in particular, secondary qualities in the world. We could put this another way. Matter in itself doesn't generate viewpoints. And there are no appearances without viewpoints. For example, there are no appearances of a rock that are neither from the front nor from the back of it for, or from any other angle. The view from nowhere of physical science does not accommodate viewpoints. The loss of appearance and of first-person viewpoint is not an accidental mislaying. It's an inevitable consequence of the scientific conception of matter and the scientific conception of the brain. The brain, being a piece of matter, must be person-free. No wonder neuroscience can't find the self, can't find the me, or the conscious agent in the brain. And this is true not only in the fundamental sense I've just highlighted, but a less fundamental but no less important sense. Persons or selves have two features which can't be captured in neural terms, unity in multiplicity and temporal depth. And I want to touch briefly on both of these. Unity in multiplicity. At any given moment, moments such as you're now experiencing, you will be aware of a multitude of experiences, sensations, perceptions, memories, thoughts, and emotions. You are co-conscious of them. 
That is to say, they're integrated into a unity of sort, the unity of the present moment. It is actually impossible to see how this integration could, could be explained neurophysiologically, because neurophysiologists assign different aspects of consciousness to spatially different parts of the brain. The pathways for perception are separate from those for emotion, which are separate from those for memory, which are separate from those for motivation, which are separate from those from judgment. Within perception, vision, hearing, and smell have different pathways and destinations. And within visual perception, different parts of the brain are supposed to be responsible for receiving the color, the shape, the distance, the classification, the purpose, and the emotional significance of seen objects. When, however, I see the glass on the table over there and see that it's broken and I feel cross about it while I hear you laughing and I recognize the laughter as yours and I'm upset and I note that the taxi I've ordered has arrived so I can catch the train that I'm aware I must not miss, many things that are kept apart must, of course, be brought together. And there's absolutely no model of this synthesis in the brain. This is a so-called binding problem. Various solutions have been offered, but they're ludicrously insufficient. And for those who are aware of the problem, I'd be happy to discuss it in question time. What about the neurological explanation of the other distinctive feature of subjectivity, temporal depth? The human subject is aware of a past, his own, and the shared past, and reaches into a future, his own and a shared future. But let me just focus on the past. There are many neurophilosophical accounts of memory, but they have one thing in common. They see memory as, in Henri Bergson's slightly scornful phrase, as a cerebral deposit. Memory is, to use a slippery term, stored as an effect on the brain, expressed in its altered reactivity. This has been demonstrated to the satisfaction of many neurophysiologists and cognitive neuroscientists in creatures as disparate as apes, chick embryos, and fruit flies. And some of the most lauded work on memory, which won Eric Kandel his 2000 Nobel Prize, has been on, wait for it, a sea slug. The failure of neurophysiological accounts of memory is a theme for a talk in itself. But here we are. Experiments on the sea slug do not capture important modes of memory, such as autobiographical memory. Sea slugs don't remember how things were in the past. The past states of material object can be retained in the present state of material object. Memories are explicitly of the past. Of course, no material object can retain an explicit past, and that is just ordinary physics. As Einstein said, physicists know the distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion, and matter, alas, does not entertain such illusions. You and I, of course, know it's not an illusion. Tomorrow's dental appointment doesn't have the same significance as yesterday's dental appointment. Now, there are many more philosophical problems in neuromania, but you're probably saying, enough already, and enough, that is. I hope it's enough to convince you of the groundlessness of neuromania and of its central ideas that neural activity is identical with consciousness, so that you are your brain and all that stuff. Now, once we've established that mind and brain activity are not identical, then we've also pulled the rug from beneath Darwinitis, since the mind ceases to be something that is co-evolved with the brain. But Darwinitis deserves some attention of its own because it's such a dominant presence in our thinking at present. The notion we're just animals and that the difference between human life in the library or the operating theater and animal life in the jungle or the savannah are more apparent than real. At most, matters a degree rather than kind certainly is predominant. It's no use to combat, combat this view by appealing to rather high-fluting activities such as composing symphonies religious worship, or fretting over transfinite numbers. The differences between ourselves and beasts are wall to wall, and they relate as much to those that seem to be mirrored in animal behavior as those in which we are explicitly unique. For we humans take the biological givens and transform them, all of them, out of all recognition. And I, want to, I want to illustrate this with two fairly homely examples. Feeding behavior and learning behavior. First, feeding. Supposing you invite me out for a meal. I've just learned you've taken on a big loan for a house that's turned into a mound of negative equity. I therefore choose the cheapest items on the menu, and I falsely declare that I'm full after the main course so as to spare the expense of a pudding. A chimpanzee gives a banana to another chimpanzee eats it. People suffering from Darwinitis would like to say both the chimp and I are doing similar things because we're both exhibiting feeding behavior. But this identity of description obscures huge differences between the chimp's behavior and mine. And anyone who's acquainted with the most routine dinner table 
will be on their guard when they hear the phrase feeding behavior applied to both humans and beasts. An ordinary human meal is the end point of a long journey away from biology. Cooking, eating, eating regulated by the clock and the calendar, the complex structure of meals and the grammar of what goes with what, the ritualistic, symbolic and celebratory aspects of eating, the multitude of items of tableware that have come from near and far, the journeys taken by the food to the table, the journeys undertaken by those who gather around the table, and the use of money as the all-purpose commodity to purchase food. food. These are just but a few of the ways in which all human dining is distanced from animal eating. These are all increasingly sophisticated aspects of the human animal who does things explicitly and whose natural medium is a community of minds extending geographically across the globe and historically into the accumulative consciousness of the race. The laid and laden table draws on four quarters of the earth and on great tracts of past and present human consciousness. Nothing comparable in animals. And take learning behavior. Here's a fairly ordinary example. I decide to improve my career prospects by signing up for a degree course which begins next year. I have a small child. I therefore do more babysitting this year in order to stockpile some tokens. Daisy the cow, Daisy the cow, bumps into an electric wire, gets a terrible shock, and henceforth avoids that place. It could be said that both Daisy the cow and I have been exhibiting learning behavior. But again, I hope you'll agree, the difference between the two forms of behavior is greater than the similarities. An example I've given illustrates something important and unique about human learning, which is often overlooked by ethologists, psychologists, and many others. Human learning is not something that merely happens. We don't bump into the things we learn from. It has to be done and organized. And this is connected with the fact that humans practice skill and memorization, while animals do not. What's more, animals do not teach their young, not at least outside of Disneyland. Human learning is a collective exercise and is mediated by institutions and involves not merely being shaped by experience, but actively acquiring factual knowledge. Let me now stand back and see the bigger picture behind the difference I've discussed. The bigger picture is that of the human world. This world is woven out of shared attention, out of a trillion cognitive handshakes. It is a semiosphere, a realm of signs and meanings, quite remote from the biosphere in which all, our other, all other sentient beings live and have their being. Most of our actions, most of our human actions in daily life, however concrete, typically make sense only with respect, respect to frameworks of which we are conscious. Frameworks which incorporate many levels, layers of abstraction. Think of all the steps you took to get to this talk today, beginning with a moment perhaps a few weeks ago when you first saw today's program. Or think of the elements that make up something as utterly common, or commonplace and utterly tedious as shopping. It would require the whole of an entire talk to unpack the innumerable implicit frames of reference that make sense of the sim seemingly simple act of buying a can of beans. And none of these frames of reference has any counterpart in the life of beasts. This world I'm talking about with its frameworks of understanding transcends the organism Homo sapiens as it was delivered by Darwinian processes hundreds of thousands of years ago. In fact, these hundreds of thousands of years are the measure of how far Darwinitis, which sees us simply as other primates, is out of date. And the attempt to stuff this inescapably shared, temporarily deep realm back into the intracranial darkness inside our skulls is inescapably doomed, and will inevitably close up all of the distances that separate us from our organic state. So we start explaining sh shopping, or indeed our aesthetic preferences, by reference to the behavior of Pleistocene man, chimpanzees, or indeed herring gulls. In short, we shall reduce the humanities to animalities. We have stepped outside of our organic bodies into a domain where things are made explicit. In that domain, we uniquely we guide, justify, and excuse our behavior according to general and abstract principles. We create cities, laws, institutions. We entertain theories about our own nature and about the world. We frame our individual lives within a shared history. And we systematically inquire into the order of things and the patterns of causation and physical laws that seem to underpin that order. These phenomena, profound and complex and pervasive though they are, are mere surface manifestations or symptoms of something even more profound, complex and pervasive. We are explicit animals, to which I've devoted an entire book. We are animals who lead our lives, living out shared and individual narratives rather than merely living them organically 
who are conscious of ourselves and of others and of the material world and of its intrinsic existence and properties in the way that no animal does. V.S. Ram Ramachandran surely spoke truly when he asserted that humanity trans transcends apod to the same degree by which life transcends mundane chemistry and physics. And this seems so obvious, it's difficult to see why many thinkers so stubbornly insist on overlooking what's in front of their noses. And the answer is in part because we are so used to using language carelessly, describing humans animalomorphically and animals anthropomorphically, that we no longer notice ourselves doing it. It's a theme for a talk in itself, and it would focus on seemingly innocent terms such as courtship and grooming. There's also a misplaced sense of honesty in which we feel forced to conclude that because we're like animals in some respects, birth, compilation, and death, and so on, we must be like animals in all respects. But this overlooks how we transform every aspect of the biological givens that frame our lives. We imagine also that after the origin of species, we're obliged to think of ourselves as animals, but to do so is to confuse our biological origins with our cultural leaves. The organisms delivered by biological processes, ultimately expression of the laws of physics, with the people who are mutually and self-shaping by processes that are remote from those seen in the biological material of our bodies. But it is our linguistic habits that are most potent. And this is true of neuromania. We personify the brain. We say how it decides, how it judges, how it communicates, how neurons signal, and so on and so forth. By personifying the brain, we're freed up to brainify the person. Some dominetics, of course, are unable to ignore what is in front of their noses and acknowledge that there is a huge ditch between man and even the biologically closest beasts. And they've been strongly attracted to the notion of the meme, first floated by Richard Dawkins in his first book, The Selfish Gene. A meme is a unit of cultural transmission, analogous to the gene, which is a unit of biological transmission. Like genes... Memes are replicators, but they use minds as vehicles. According to many memophiles, they're like vir viruses that invade our mind brains. The memes that survive are those that, while they may not be good for the organisms carrying them, are good for the survival of the groups of organisms. And so we have the Darwinian notion of natural selection resulting in differential survival of the fittest applied to cultural change. If you find this notion plausible, you will find it less so when you look at the kinds of things that evolutionary psychologists give an example of memes. Here are some suggested by Daniel Dunnett, and they once, at once reveal why the idea is vacuous. Returnable bottles, Moby Dick, the salt agreement, faith or tolerance for free speech. Well, faith or tolerance for free speech, while they may be good for the group, I'm not entirely sure, are hardly items with their own boundaries, as is a gene. Abstract nouns do not correspond to items with their own edges. Secondly, the difference between the genotype and the phenotype is lost in meme theory. Thirdly, ideas such as free speech are ones we have to understand in order to embrace, and we may not assent to them, or do so on some occasions, not on others. But try assenting to or dissenting from your genes. And finally, it makes the mind a kind of lumber room, full of bric-a-brac, in short, meme theory is a measure of the desperate need that is felt by some thinkers to biologize culture and hence the people that make, maintain, and modify culture. Well, it's time you'll be glad to learn for me to come to a close. I spent my hour addressing what seems to be one of the most widely received ideas of our time, namely that biology is the key to human nature, that we're best understood as largely unconscious or programmed organisms operating in a natural world rather than as conscious agents acting in a uniquely human one. And it follows from this that traditional humanities are biological sciences in a primitive state of development. Biologism is propped up by these two pillars of unwisdom, neuromania and Darwinitis. And I hope you're sufficiently persuaded by my arguments to agree that the most appropriate, uh, appropriate place for these ideas is illustrated on the slide. But you might think that no one takes them serious enough to form their conclusions. If this were so, they would still be important as obstacles to our trying to understand our nature in a way that doesn't involve supernatural explanation. For me, a humanist atheist, naturalistic or biologistic accounts of what we are are as unsatisfactory and imprisoning as supernatural ones. A great task lies ahead in trying to make sense of ourselves and neuromania and Darwinitis get in the way, and it could be extremely exciting. I'm one with Jerry Fodor when he says that we can't as things stand now so much as imagine the solution to the problems of human consciousness. 
The revisions of our concepts and theories that imagining a solution will eventually require are likely to be very deep and very unsettling. There's hardly anything we may not have to cut loose from before the problem is through with us, to which I say amen and yippee. What's more, neuromania and Darwinitis may be worse than obstructive, stopping us even starting to think. They may be dangerous. For example, John Gray, a hugely acclaimed celebrity misanthrope, has argued in his best-selling Straw Dogs and many other books that Darwin has demonstrated that we're not particularly special. Human life has no more meaning than that of a slime mold. Speak for yourself, mate. Man is only one of many species and not obviously worth preserving. Preserving. Well, ideas have consequences. Abstract arguments may begin by looking like harmless puppies, but they may grow to be something else, which is why I've ridden this hobby horse for so long and so hard. It's time you'll be glad to learn for me to wind up. As the late, great Humphrey Littleton might have put it, I hear the tortoise of time exploding in the microwave of eternity. And I've spent my tortoise of time criticizing what seems to be one of the most widely received ideas of our present age, namely that biology is the key to human nature, that we are best understood as largely unconscious or programmed organisms operating in a natural world rather than as conscious agents acting in a uniquely human one. And that it follows from this that traditional humanities are biological sciences in a primitive state of development. None of this is true. Those who try to explain love, conscience, human institutions, by describing what they find when they peer into the standalone brain, are like someone who applies a stethoscope to this item, this acorn, hoping to hear the rustling of the breezes in an oak forest. Neuromaniacs and Darwinitics are trying to find the community of minds forged from a trillion cognitive handshakes in bits of the standalone brain, lighting up an intracranial darkness. Now, I ought to end by emphasizing that I have no problem with biology. For God's sake, I'm a doctor whose treatments have depended on biological science. I spent 30 or more years adding my small grains of truth to the great monument that is clinical neuroscience. Nor do I have a religious agenda. I'm an atheist humanist. Nor am I crazy enough to question Darwin's theory of evolution. And I'm not a creationist nutter. I've been accused of all these things. And finally, and don't mind if you call me a racist, imperialist swine, but I'm, I would object to the fact of being called a dualist, one who thinks of the mind as being like a ghost in a meat machine. But this gives me the cue for a final thought from the philosopher Gilbert Ryle in his classic, The Concept of Mind. Man, he said, need not be degraded to a machine by being denied to be a ghost in a machine. He might, after all, be a sort of animal, namely a higher mammal. There has yet to be ventured the hazardous leap to the hypothesis that perhaps he is man. And I think it's time we took that hazardous leap. So there you are. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention, or at least for courtesy simulating it. Thank you. Absolutely, yes, I, just as I feared, yes. No, I mean, I'm very sympathetic to the overall project. And I, I will repeat the question in case you can't hear from back, so don't worry at all, I will repeat the question, yes. Yeah. If uh, what Sam's saying is essentially that um, 
I don't have to be worried if neuroscientists identify the mind and the brain because there is still something that's left over which I can access, uh, access as a first-person being. Essentially, first-person being has actually no place in neuroscience. You've got to remember what neuroscience, the objects of neuroscience, the contents of neuroscience are, and they are neural discharges, which are utterly and totally impersonal. So I feel that if I identi if, if identify the human being with these impersonal discharges, which can be described in different ways, but they're fundamentally described biophysically, then I've, as it were, marginalized or elided the first person being. Sam, I'm absolutely sure I've misunderstood your point, and you'll tell me. Okay. Well, no. Is that okay to get, yes, yes, come back, yeah. I'm not too sure, because if you look at neural activity, most neural activity is not associated with consciousness, never mind first-person being. So if, if I identify mind, consciousness, or whatever with neural activity, then essentially I'm saying that it is rather similar to what goes in the spinal cord, the cerebellum, all sorts of areas where um, there is no consciousness and no first-person first being. I think what many people who are not familiar with neuroscience don't know is that the 99.99% of neural activity is not associated with consciousness at all. And that which is not associated with consciousness is not at all different from that which is supposed to be identical with consciousness. The pursuit of neural correlates of consciousness has turned, to be, turned out to be the pursuit of a will-o'-wisp. I still haven't been completely engaged with Sam's point, but this is my sort of holding position for the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Paul makes a very good point, and there are two aspects. One is I've moved too quickly, and he's absolutely right. And the only punishment for saying that is to get him to read my 1,000-page trilogy, which is absolutely, uh, probably a disproportionate punishment, because I do move very slowly in, term, uh, in relation to that. But I think there's a very interesting point here. Supposing you think that neural activity is a necessary but not a sufficient condition of consciousness, how do you explain the kinds of things that Paul's referring to, which is, for example, neural discharges seem to be associated in a standalone way with experiences. And the most striking example of that is the work that Penfield did. He was a neurosurgeon who stimulated, for quasi-ethical reasons, the cerebral cortexes of people who are about to undergo um, epilepsy surgery. And he found that if he stimulated bits of the brain, um, he could, people would actually have formed memories. There's a patient described, she as a result of stimulation in the brain, she would have the sense of a circus coming to town, which actually related uh, to what happened when she was a child. And that may make you think that neural activity is not merely necessary, but a sufficient condition for experience. Wait a moment. You've got to remember those patients were awake. 
So already there was a background wakefulness in which this occurred. Secondly, that neural activity would not have been translated into a childhood memory if there had not been a childhood experience had in the conventional way. And so I don't think that notion that the standalone brain under certain circumstances, that observation that the standalone brain under certain circumstances can produce quite complex formed experiences in any way undermines the idea that on the whole, or primarily, the neural activity is a necessary but not a sufficient condition of experience. It's two unsatisfied customers. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's a clear description of what happens when you wake. And again, this question of the necessary conditions of wakefulness. And what happens when you wake is that delta waves and slow activities are replaced by alpha activity and beta activity and so on. That specific phenomenon of taking a bit of time to work out where you are hasn't been neurologically um, teased out. But it is a very interesting thing, because sometimes you can immediately know where you are, and sometimes it takes a bit of time to put it together. Putting it together takes greater time, usually either when you've had too much to drink, but more often when you're in a strange place, when you're trying to map where you are against familiar places. But it hasn't been described neurologically. But I don't think, uh, I mean, to me, the miracle, Paul Vary once said, you know, who's, wh why do we worry about the miracle of the resurrection of, you know, the flesh? The fact we are resurrected every morning is a total miracle. Exactly how it happens, I don't know. But it seems to me that um, the fact that you actually make sense of what's around you when you wake up is more extraordinary than the fact you don't make sense. In Proust's A la Recherche de Tom Perdue, he just, uh, you, you were obviously referring to Proust's way, he described beautifully what it's like waking up in an unfamiliar place and trying to map onto that unfamiliar place the familiar place, and then realizing you're not in the familiar place, and that curtain isn't the wardrobe after all, and that sort of stuff. Um, I've given you a very unsatisfactory answer to a question I found very stimulating. So all I've given you is a response to a stimulus rather than um, an answer to your question. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. Like, you know, what is love? I mean, the idea you can find love in the singlet gyrus or whatever. And incidentally, all, all these areas are given out to all sorts of other things. I often think these neophrenologists are like crooked state, estate agents. They sell the same property to thousands and thousands of clients. You know, so you know, the singlet gyrus has got other business to do. Um, but I agree with you. you know, if you want to find out what love is, talk to someone. And even better, listen to someone who is a genius who's thought about it and can articulate it. You know. I'm not a Cartesian because I don't believe, as it were, not of the god of the gaps, but an ontology of the gaps. Just because neural explanations don't seem to deliver a full understanding of the nature of consciousness doesn't mean to say I've then got to reach for an even more bankrupt account, which is Cartesian dualism. We all know the problems with Cartesian dualism. So I wouldn't want to go out of the frying pan into the fire. 
I, I, I'm an ontological agnostic. I genuinely don't know, but at least I know that I don't know. And uh, I'm, really, I'm really sort of, you know, so I'm, in that sense, that at least is an advance in a quasi sort of wisdom. I mean, I, I know what you're saying, Nick. Nick and I were housemen, by the way, in 1970 in Lambeth Hospital, so we, uh, we go back a long way. But it just seems to me that consciousness is fundamentally relational. And this came up in the discussions we were having today in a workshop that uh, Dan had organized, and that um, it takes two to tango. And just to relate consciousness to something inside the cranium is clearly wrong. I don't think we can even begin to understand how we shall make sense of the fact that certain objects like pebbles are thoughtless and certain objects like you are thoughtful. I don't think we've even, we can begin yet, but we won't begin until we move, until we set aside the belief we've already got the answer. So what I'm saying is essentially negative, Nick, I have to say. Uh, I don't have a positive answer, and I'm just sort of, you know, um, on the lookout. You know. Oh, hang on a second. So now, now this is appeal to complexity. Nine billion neurons, uh, more connections than there are in atoms in the universe, and that sort of thing. I'm not impressed by numbers. If you have one stone, that's not going to be any less conscious than 14 billion stones. So, in a way, uh, I don't think sheer numbers, even numbers of connections, because what brings it all together? It has to be something outside of that. And, and it's interesting, when people talk about, say, trying to explain, you know, I was talking about co-consciousness, how at any given moment, there's Dan aware of the pressure uh, of the floor on his feet, he's aware that you know, time's going by and I'm crapping on, he's aware of the light around him and so on and so forth, and he's probably worrying about his pension, all that sort of thing, all's happening on at the moment. <laughs> time. And it's all happening at any given moment. How does that all come together? Now, for neuroscientists, they say, of course it comes together because you've got all these connections. But actually, it's very difficult to have any sense of things being sum totaled through the total of connections. Because those connections, who's totaling them? Who's bringing them together? And if you have converging pathways, for example, which are what connections do, how do you get merging, or rather, without mushing? How do you get integration without, as it were, just a sort of Kenwood mix of fragments? And we haven't got any answers to that. <laughs> my response to race. No. Um, so it, it's a slightly different mind, but I, I did want to challenge you a little bit about the differential that you drew between man and other animals. Yeah. And you used, um, you used eating or feeding as one example, and you used cities and city behavior as another. And I just would, would like you to sort of tease that out a bit in terms of let me give you a sort of counter challenge, if you like, or argument. You're probably familiar with Lewis Mumford's The Hive in the City and so on. It just seems to me that there's a difference between dovetailing automaticities which occur in pack hunting and in beehives and so on and the kind of elective uh, involvement we have in our own social groups where I have a multitude of identities, explicit identities, a multitude of joinings and dissents and differences. So I'm not part of a pack. And there are situations which I can be part of a pack. But if I go to a dinner party, I'm not really, as it were, joining in a present uh, a pack of people who are feeding. I'm actually electing to go to that dinner party. And I think, well, Saturday night, got nothing better to do. Perhaps the Smiths will give me an invitation. Actually, there's a good film on, but perhaps I might go because it might be quite useful because, you know, Smith's brother is 
got a bit of patronage to disperse and so on and so forth. That's quite different from the kind of spatial aggregation of animals that have dovetailing automaticities, that have instincts that hand in glove with each other. It's completely different. If I think of my spatial group, it includes people in Stockport at the moment, people in America, etc., etc. It's quite different from the packs that literally are spatial aggregations. Does, does that answer? And, and is that a reasonable answer to the question? Can I, can I comment to that? Yeah, yeah, it sounds okay. Yes, yeah. No, I'm not the chair. Yeah. I think that's a good point, but even before, if, if, if we look at the time when people actually were relatively impoverished and living in subsistence, life was still complex in a different way from when it was gone. Well, I, I think that would be comparable to what animals are doing in the past. But you see, it's not... It, yeah. It's so sophisticated that it's moved away. Mm. I mean, first of all, the fact is, you're absolutely right, we are more sophisticated, and so that explains how we have moved away. So, in other words, that gap is real. Now, I would emphasize the reality of the gap. But even if you look at the pre-agricultural era, when people were hunters and gatherers, there is lots of evidence from artifacts and so on, that life was completely differently organized than it would be from uh, within primates. Take a chimpanzee. What was the height of technological achievement of a chimpanzee five million years ago? They could use a stone to break a nut. Yippee. What's the height of technological achievement of a chimpanzee now? Use a stone to break a nut. Well done, chimpanzee. As long about, as far back as 2.8 million years ago, well before we've, we, the agricultural revolution, we already were creating pebble choppers, very complex tools that relate to our bodies in totally different ways from the animal's pseudo tools do to their animal bodies. So long before, as it were, we escaped from the pressure of the need to subsist uh, and, and the pressure of the exigency of hunger, uh, we'd already were quite different. But you're absolutely right. We have gradually moved away. I think you, you would put the moving away a bit, a bit more recent than I would, but I think we're both agreed on the fundamental point is that there's been a bigger and bigger gap between us and primates. And it's a different kind of, it's a qualitative gap rather than a merely quantitative gap. But in a sense, I think you're supporting what I'm saying in a way. Yeah. The lack of comparison, yeah. This is a question of why there is this desire to biologize us, why we want to be Darwinistic and so on. I think there are several reasons. One is the feeling that after Darwin, we have to acknowledge honestly what we are. I think it's a misplaced sense of honesty, you know, that we have to recognize that because we are generated by the same processes as generated chimpanzees and centipedes and so on, we must be essentially like chimpanzees and centipedes, and therefore we overlook the huge differences. Secondly, there is the secular drive, and I speak as someone who's an atheist, the feeling that there is no alternative to a supernatural explanation other than the naturalistic explanation. I think those are the two. There are other also attractions of a biologistic view. One is it's deliciously simplifying, which is great, you know. And the other thing is it gets us off the hook. You know, if, if we can explain our bad behavior, either by our the fact that we were, you know, this is a biological prescription we're following out, 
it makes it much more tolerable. It also uh, gives people a sense of superiority. I remember when I was reading some of Zola's novels, I had a sense that although he's a great novelist, he loved seeing us as beasts, you know, that somewhere and so on. It gave him a sense of superiority. You know, you think you're special, you think and so on, and you're not. So there are lots of motives, I think, uh, for um, biologizing us. Of course, when we biologize ourselves, we sort of exempt ourselves. You know, when John Gray says we're no more meaningful than slime mold, he doesn't mean the professor of European thought at the London School of Economics, which he was, was no more meaningful than slime mold. He meant you lot who think you are more meaningful. <laughs> yeah. 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 Not, not of Darwinism. I'm happy with Darwinism, but Darwinitis, yes, yeah. I mean, the second one is easy. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I'm an atheist, that every conception of God that I've come across actually is self-contradictory. And I don't have a placeholder in my mind for self-contradictory concepts. So I'm happy to park up the idea of God and get on with being a human being. But, um, I, and I leave aside all the arguments about whether religion is good or bad for humanity. We don't know. We can't run the tape twice with and without religion, so we can't sort of test it out. Now, when it comes to what is the alternative to Darwinitis, it seems to me that one can, as I have done at boring length in a trilogy, look at how we humans, by, with a certain biological advantage, escape from biology. So I can deal with making Darwinism compatible with humans being qualitatively and fundamentally different from other primates. The second one is much more difficult. I don't quite know what to do with neuromania, and that comes to an earlier question, is that basically if we cannot explain human consciousness and the kind of things we are as configurations of matter, what do we, you know, wh uh, where do we go from here? And I, I've seen plenty of wrong paths, panpsychism, invoking quantum mechanics in all sorts of ignorant ways, um, the idea of the extended mind, uh, supersizing the mind and so on, all of those things fail. So I think that is a much more difficult task. But we won't even start if we think we've solved it already, if, if we're enthralled to a wrong solution. So to summarize, I hope you understand what I'm, I, I am as an atheist. I'm happy with coping with the gap between Darwinism and Darwinitis. I'm deeply, deeply unhappy with my own position on, uh, or, or trying to get a positive position um, in relation to what it is to be a conscious creature. I'm actually working a book on time at the moment, and I think in relation to intentionality and tense and so on, and that I'm approaching by indirection, and I'm hoping that something wonderful is going to happen in the next year or so, unless, but who knows? Yes. I mean, he did describe in his Nobel Prize lecture that he got memory on the shelf because he saw memory as basically understood in, the trans in what happens to synaptic connections after experience. Uh, 
His experiments were on a plysia, which is a little beast that looks like a snot from a dinosaur's nose, which is about that long. And what he did was he looked at uh, a poor old plysia's learning from experience. He was very, a very good choice of a beast because it was rather dim uh, and very ugly. So it didn't have legal advice and it didn't, att uh, didn't attract the attention of Animal Liberation Front. But what, what, what he actually found was that uh, there were very, I mean, he did this work exquisitely and beautifully, and he deserved his Nobel Prize, Hazen said, to look at what's happened uh, in the changed behavior of uh, a plysia in response to shocks to its tail and so on. And what I would say to him, first of all, this is not memory. This is change in behavior. It, it's sort of habit memory in a sort of way, but it misses out on all of those things that you and I know from memory. A plysia didn't have nostalgia for the time before it met Eric Kandel and got its tail fried. <laughs> he himself, actually, I've just reviewed a book of his for the TLS, for, for Wall Street Journal, God, News Corp, but um, uh, called The Age of Insight, in which he looks to ways in which art and science and those approaches might meet, and he tilts it entire to science. So he explains that Klimt and Sheila and uh, Kokoschka were really unconscious neuroscientists. They knew how to tickle up the brain and so on. So I think, I don't know what I would say to him. All I would say to him is, you can't explain what we are by looking at the transform, or, or, in, or, or indeed what we've become by looking at the transformation of patterns of neural activity. Um, but I don't think he would listen. And as I say, he, even looking at art, and he's quite a art, serious art connoisseur, particularly of Viennese modernism, he still tries to see it in terms of its capacity to tickle up our brains. So I suspect whatever I said to him, he would reinsert the plugs into his ears. LAUGHTER 